Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read with me, your host, Rachel Polanski. Um, what's new? What's good? <laughs> it is another hot afternoon here in Los Angeles. I'm bringing you the five books that I read in the past week-ish. It's been a little over a week since I've recorded. Um, sometimes these books, like I said, not sometimes, I would say 95% of the time, are not really curated with like a specific sort of, you know, woman going through a divorce and ends up in a small town and has three kids. You know, I could definitely find like more specific things, but as I've mentioned in many episodes, if you're a longtime listener, um, that the, um, it's kind of just at the mercy of the Los Angeles Public Library based on when books are available, as well as my rapidly multiplying Kindle and physical book library. So I'm just kind of all over the place in this. However, that means that if you are a longtime listener, uh, first time caller, or just a uh, first time fan listening for the first time, that unless you're really looking to like read those specific, you know, five plus books a week or even my, I guess, word on it. I guess it, uh, I initially started this podcast with the intention that I read five plus books a week and I would talk to you guys about them. And I think as we are coming up on the one year anniversary, definitely um, thinking of ways to shake up the format and keep um, not only you guys interested and engaged, but also myself, because I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to keep doing that no matter what. But um behind the scene little uh you know this is a behind the scenes exclusive that i've definitely you know been talking with my producer slash boyfriend jason um and a few other people and just kind of you know thinking about ways that we can keep this fresh and entertaining um also for me and just new and fun ways to challenge myself um so that all being said that is going to come in the future whether that means then we're gonna you know play around with some episode stuff um in this one i kind of did just happen to choose five books um and i think like four of the five definitely fit the theme with a little caveat that i just really wanted to throw in casey wilson book that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, definitely also started thinking about, like, I know I, I've done a couple of episodes in the beginning where I really, like, word vomited and spewed a lot of thoughts about reading. Um, I also did, like, a nostalgic book reads and just sort of, like, the five top, or not five exactly, but, like, the six or so book series that, like, really stuck out and changed me as a reader um, in a broad spectrum. But I think also looking back at just, like, how many books I've read and which books really stand out. Maybe they're just the best books overall. Maybe they're the best literary books. Maybe they're the best throwback books. I say that quote unquote for the audio listeners because a throwback book um, could be something as old as even like a few years ago because again, I just happen to read mostly contemporary fiction, sometimes as contemporary as like literally came out that week. Um, sometimes it might be a bit delayed because of when I get to it or because of when we record. Um, and then sometimes we throw in a book from the late 1990s, like last week's um, episode or no, I'm sorry, two weeks before the Tribes of Palos Verdes. Um, but anyways, today we are, as we discussed the five books that I chose, um, like I said, four of the five kind of fit this theme. Um, of confronting one's past self. Um, I've, you know, been doing a lot of that kind of in my own personal life. Um, I think this quarantine has really forced me to examine a lot of things and be alone and be present with myself in a way that I didn't used to before just because I'm much more alone. <laughs> um, either whether that's, you know, Jason's doing his homework and I'm doing my homework, but I'm not going into an office surrounded by the hubbub anymore. And I have more time to think about really myself and you know i say that myself you know both my space self and just myself and i think um four of these books confront that in one way or another um and when i say you know the the confronting of the past self too um i think there's a lot to be said about the duality of the self as well and sort of you know who we are in private and who we are in public um a lot of these books deal with um the private self in the sense of you know we get to get inside the character's head and know them from a first person perspective but then also the public self is how they appear to other people and how the decisions that they've made um, prior to when we're reading the book, whether that moment actually takes place in the present or not depends on the book um, and how that can kind of, you know, shape a human in different ways. Um, a couple of these are like a little more uplifting, a little more lighthearted, um, and a couple, um, at least one of these is definitely a little bit darker. Um, we will get into that. So 
first, I guess we'll start out with the sort of the uh, the anomaly, but uh, just in the sense that I guess, you know, this also deals with the confronting of the self just in like a memoir way as opposed to a novel way um, and also in a more in a humorous uh, way that sort of, you know, it's different when it's actually written by the person and those are the stories that the person's telling versus a fictionalized novel. Um, but either way, the first book that we're talking about this week is The Wreckage of My Presence by Casey Wilson. Um, so I definitely was familiar with Casey Wilson. She starred in the show Happy Endings, which I started and then for some reason or another, like didn't really get into or finish, but especially after reading this book, mind has definitely changed. Need to read, a uh, need to watch ASAP. Um, She's also best friends with June Diane Raphael, who is near and dear to my heart because of her starring role as Julie on Burning Love, which is a Bachelor spoof television show, like very deep cut that was like on E! Entertainment in about, I believe, 2009, 2010-ish. So quite a while ago, maybe even earlier than that. Um, but it is, I think you can buy it on Amazon, <laughs> which is where what I did because I actually watch it so much. Um, I, when I first found it, it was on Hulu, but I think at this time it may only be on Amazon. Long story short, um, Casey is just... I don't want to say just, um, she is an actress. She is been in, um, I think she's also currently starring in the show Black Monday. Um, she um, is also a comedian. She's a writer. She has a podcast. Um, she's a mom and she's a wife and she's a lot of different things. And this book, as this title states, The Wreckage of My Presence Essays, um, revisits points in her life in no particular order. Um, and that's what I think, you know, it is a memoir in essays, but it's not necessarily a memoir in the sense that it follows this neat timeline narrative. Um, as you can probably imagine, being an actress, especially when you're starting out, is no easy feat. So she definitely uh, shares about her struggles trying to find her foot into the acting world and a lot of the not glamorous stuff. I think what's really great about this book, too, is it really um, highlights that she's very aware of her privilege and aware of all the uh, the positives and the things that have allowed her to get to the place in her life that she is now. So she's, you know, starting off on that baseline saying, by no means do I understand the struggles of anything else. And by no, you know, someone who's different than me and by no means am I comparing my plight to yours. I think that's what the title of the wreckage of my presence to is like, you know, obviously it's a little bit tongue in cheek and self-aware, but also very much understanding that like, it's more than just a, the blip of her presence, like the wreckage. And that can sometimes cause a lot of good things, but it can also cause a lot of bad things. Um, so she's very honest, um, like I said, about also, you know, how she became who she is. There's a lot about her family, which at times reads like too crazy and like too good to be true. And of course, I mean, I'm sure there's a little bit of dramatization in these, um, but more or less, you know, it seems like she came from a pretty, a, a fun, loving family that definitely had its quirks um, that were maybe a little more obvious than some other families. Um, she also talks a lot about how she met her husband and her plights in dating before him. So it covers, you know, rather than just being a collection of essays about dating or a collection of essays about your career or how I got to where I am, it takes all of those things. There's also um, a few chapters about motherhood and her journey to that and her relationship with her kids. And they're all just like wacky and cool. Um, so definitely now I feel like she's like my new BFF. Like I'm still thinking now, you know, revisit visiting the cover and looking at the picture of her. And this is just so fun to read also as someone who lives in Los Angeles and recognizes a lot of the touchstones and highlights from her essays. That's always a fun little added piece. Um, so now I feel, you know, I was definitely aware of her before and now I'm more than aware of her. I feel like she just like should be my new BFF. Um, <laughs> so she is now, you know, I'm following her on Twitter and Instagram now. And if you're fans of like, you know, Jenny Mullen, Chelsea Handler, um, Obviously, you know, June Diane Raphael, if you're familiar, I think she's probably best known at this time for the How Did This Get Made podcast with Jason Mantazukas and Paul Shear, who's also her husband. Um, her Casey Wilson's husband is Dave Wilson, who created the show Happy Endings, as well as Black Monday and a few other things. Um, if you're into, you know, making light out of some objectively privileged situations, but some subjectively, you know, things that range from, you know, a mountain to a molehill, uh, then check then check this one out. Um, and now we are going to sort of dive into the fictional novels that explore the confronting of past selves in different ways. Um, the first one we have is A Bright Ray of Darkness by Ethan Hawke. Yes, that Ethan Hawke. Did you know that he was an author? Because I didn't, but apparently this is the first novel he's written in 20 years. So some 20 years ago, he wrote a book and now he wrote this one and it was fantastic and I think um the main character is an actor and I think that there's a lot of 
metafiction and a lot of metaphysical thinking and not in the sense of like, you know, psychics and that kind of metaphysical stuff, but in the sense that like the blurring of, you know, put, this is sort of a story that could only really be told from an actor. I hope that a lot of it is um, fictional and I don't think, I'm sure Pac is playing a lot from his own experiences while still creating his own character. So like there's that meta self of like Hawks as an actor and as someone who's I'm sure can relate to our main character. Um, um, and that also goes with sort of, you know, the wreckage of my presence could also be applied to this where in the sense that our main character is an actor who is going to be starring in the Henry VIII play of, uh, yeah, it's Noam, that's Henry the Fo Henry the Fourth. Guess who can't read social media and or remember Shakespeare. Um, he is starring as Hotspur in Henry IV, um, this Broadway play, and he is reeling off of a separation from his wife and um, trying to figure out how to maintain his relationship with her and his children. Um, they are both separated, living in New York City. Um, so there's a lot of meditations on the theater system itself. A lot of the novel does take place around our main characters. Why can't I find his name? <laughs> Yikes. Um, da, 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 da. Um, what, yeah, William, I'm sorry, which is kind of fitting because that's also William Shakespeare. Um, he just kind of is a hot mess and we see him slowly decline while, you know, in his personal life while also kind of committing everything, his anger and resentment and frustrations into the role of Hotspur, um, which is kind of also the young uh, prince who's sort of crazy in the Henry IV story, which I am vaguely familiar with. Um, how he just kind of takes out the wreckage and presence of his life and personal things into the character and how the theater scene operates sort of as a family um well, you know there's everyone playing their own parts again both on stage there's like the narcissistic well-known actor there's the director who's like just trying to like have this go well there's the woman who's like kind of in love with him kind of not um so he's definitely you know he is he's an addict he's just you know going through drugs and alcohol to self-medicate while just trying to like make his, this performance the best it's ever been while just trying to also like confront his own shame with his past experiences and also like what he believes is important to fuel himself um so i think that you know like i said ethan hawk is a very famous actor he's been in the industry for over 30 years i think and so he knows a lot about the ins and outs i think he's not only acted i think he's definitely like written and directed and produced and done you know other things behind the scenes and i you know you can remove that from it but i think like knowing that he has that background and perspective brings a lot more to the story and to the character william um so check that one out um next we have last summer at the golden hotel by Alyssa friedland this one's really just i know i say fun a lot but it's definitely a lighter you know beach read it's a little bit um longer than the typical beach read it's almost 400 pages but it flies by really quickly it is about the titular golden hotel um which was in its heyday in like the 1950s and the 1960s around when like the film dirty dancing took place um also like the marvelous mrs Maisel. um so you picture that time when the cat skills were thriving and that's when the golden hotel is thriving and it brings together the goldman and the weingold families and so they have this thriving partnership with this hotel and we get to see their relationship and their subsequent children <laughs> Um, through that summer, which kind of intersperses with now we are in present day, um, the hotel is not doing very well, and there's the question of whether or not to sell it. So it's sort of a basic premise. I mean, there's nothing crazy about that. The question isn't will they or will they not sell, but the question is what does the issue of selling and what does the issue of letting go and changing the past, whether that means keeping the hotel and upgrading it and changing it and making it more accessible for a uh, society 70 years later, or whether that means, you know, clinging to tradition, saying forget it, or selling and starting anew. And so obviously different people in the families, there's different generations, there's the matriarch and the patriarch of both sides. Um, there's conflicting relationships, you know, there's forbidden love across the both sides, though it's by no means, you know, like a Romeo and Juliet character. Um, there's a lot of like nostalgia and love for the Catskills area, which is also like fondly known as the Borscht Belt. I have never actually been there, but it's definitely 
I, between this novel and Dirty Dancing and Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which I've seen, um, and I've just, you know, I'm sure I've read other stories that have taken place in the Catskills. It's definitely a location that is vibrant and comes alive, and the hotel is a character in itself that means a lot to a lot of different people, um, and the selling of it, whether, and, you know, even if they don't sell it, even if they do keep it, that's going to change relationships and change things for a lot of different people. Um, so it's sort of, you know, figuring out whether or not you know you know you have to change and even not changing uh as pearl jam says an elderly woman standing behind a counter in a small town i change by not changing at all and so either way that's changing and how that affects different people and the confronting of one's past because you're literally forced to in the present by selling um this hotel which is both literally and physically the most important thing for these two families um is all plays out in this light-hearted romp through the cat skills <laughs> And next we have another slightly more lighthearted one. I say slightly, no, it's pretty funny and it's pretty realistic. I mean, it's definitely not like as lighthearted as the last summer at the Golden Hotel, but there is a little bit, you know, like it's not all sunshine and rainbows in that, um, but there's a little bit more just like of realism in our next book, Superhost by Kate Russo. Um, so our main character is named Bennett Driscoll. He is a former successful painter who we meet in sort of the, the midlife crisis era of his life. He is recently divorced. He is forced to Airbnb his luxurious home, which was once like the pinnacle of the um, successful relationship he had with his wife. He is forced to Airbnb that in order to keep the house. Um, as a struggling artist, he then stays in the studio behind the house. Um, and the studio at first starts off with the dual pers We get to know Bennett, we get to know his perspective, and we get to know that he's kind of this lonely guy who's, you know, not only trying to confront his past self literally by revisiting the paintings and the career that he stopped doing for so long um, and the painting the way he also started out doing nude paintings and then transitioned to fruit because he had a young daughter and he didn't want her to be embarrassed by that um, and the way that that you know inadvertently and advertently changed his shape and way of the future um, so then we're uh, we see the perspective of Alicia, who's a young American. And at first I was like, okay, this is a romance novel. Like, some, you know, Bennett's newly divorced and clearly lonely and looking for company. Alicia's entering into the story. She's an American on vacation. She's looking for some romance. And, oh, they seem like they would be a good match. And there's a little bit of, like, will they, won't they? And maybe partly because I didn't read the full description. And also I just, you know, wanted to go in a little blind. It's not, I, spoiler alert, it's not a romance story about Bennett and Alicia necessarily. Um, it is about the three different women who stay at Bennett's property throughout the time that we are seeing him in the novel. They are three different women at very different points in their lives, at very different points in their relationships. Um, the way that Bennett interacts with each one is vastly different. Um, Bennett is also uh, forming a new relationship with a different sort of woman than he's used to. So we get to see his perspective intertwining with these three different women's perspectives as they're staying at the Airbnb. Bennett is there the whole time in the studio, but he himself is changing. These women are changed. Um, whether or not it would have happened because of this Airbnb or not remains sort of up to the universe, but through their experience staying there, um, they are changed. And it's just very like human and real Bennett just was sort of the character who was like just self-deprecating enough that he wasn't like Mr. Perfect but not so you know like got these heavy demons you know he's just the sort of everyday guy who has that little je ne sais quoi that comes in alive off the page and doesn't exact he's the kind of guy that's you know slow to warm up and might you might miss it first but once he's able to sort of regrow his shell and or, you know, come out of his shell or regrow that sort of, you know, strong exterior that he had when he was at the height of his career and blossom and live his life and figure out his own relationships. And it all is just like, you know, it takes place in England. So it's fun to kind of visit different parts of London, you know, even if it's just via a book, it's better than nothing. Um, <laughs> excuse me for the water break. And last but certainly, certainly, not least, we have Jane Anonymous by Lori Faria Stolars. So this actually came out, I think, a, a little bit over a year ago, last January, so pre-pandemic. Um, and Lori Faria Stolars, the reason I found this is because I was like, I was 
thinking about, you know, what books can I sort of revisit and talk about and, you know, curate some more capsules from the past or whatnot. And I immediately thought of Lori Faria Stolarz. She had the White is for Magic series. Um, she ha She's written just like a bunch of cool psychological horror as well as like supernatural horror. Um, I don't need to go into her catalog right now. She's written some young adults, some adult novels, everything she's written is great. She's the kind of mystery writer who really does know how to keep you on your toes and keep things turning. Um, so this one's a little bit darker, more than just a supernatural mystery. Um, this is definitely more of a psychological thriller slash not even so much a thriller. Um, our main character, her name is Jane. The It's called Jane Anonymous because this is the story of a young girl who we know was found but went through this horrible trauma and was kidnapped and kept hostage for about six months and then so the story starts with her sort of telling her tale as this Jane Anonymous in every town, New England, um, everything sort of framed as, you know, this anonymous police report meant to tell us of this young girl's story. Um, so we get to know Jane in the sense that, like, she is already conflicted as she's dealing with the trauma of being held hostage and kidnapped for six months by someone who she was manipulated heavily by and as a young girl i mean that's a sort of trauma that would be hor horrifying for anyone um especially with the way she's further manipulated into um the you know the way she views her experience is different than what actually happened i don't want to say more than that because it's a spoiler um but it's again it's not so much about like there's a twist perhaps that is pretty obvious, but again, it's not so much about what happened, but as to, you know, how, not even how this happened too, because it wasn't her fault. It was clearly a deranged man who had no right to take her, but how do we move on from trauma and how do you, how do you, con you know, the past self that you left when she comes back in her room is exactly the same and the foods she used to like are there and her parents are just trying so hard to she's not the same person that she was and those six months whether or not it's the stuff that she the stuff she internalized actually happened were horrifying and traumatic for, for many reasons and it's not just going to be like snap your fingers and go back to everything is normal the relationships that she had in the past and who she was in the past is different now i mean everyone's different from six months ago whether or not that's just you changed your hair or you got a new piercing but you know <laughs> being kidnapped in that trauma even if it's for a week if it's for years no matter what it's really um it's a lot to take in. And so I know that there's a sequel uh, that just came out. So I have that on my to be read list um, or sort of like a spiritual sequel. I don't know if it's directly about the character Jane, but her story influences the rest of it. Um, but with, with that, um, we have confronted our past selves. We've decided that Casey Wilson is my new BFF. And we slash I have decided that you should read at least one of these books and or tell me what you've been reading and what I should be reading. Um, and apologies also if you have already recommended something and I haven't gotten to it yet, rest assured it is on my to be read list. That just is at the mercy of a lot of different factors. So I'll get there. Um, but until next time, stay reading. Bye.